whether you're watching in Jacksonville, Tampa, Orlando, or locally right here in the Space Coast. My colleague Jessica Williams just gave her final weather brief at L-30 minutes to United Launch Alliance, Eastern Range, and NASA officials and gave a greater than 90% go for weather, so we are not tracking any issues at this time. As a reminder, my colleagues and I are here to ensure that the weather is safe for launch, and we do that through the evaluation of 10 lightning launch commit criteria, which are designed to protect against both rocket triggered and natural lightning. In addition, we also monitor user weather constraints like surface wind speed and precipitation. And while things are looking really good for launch this morning, should we need to utilize tomorrow's backup window, we do anticipate conditions deteriorating as we see a cold front move through the region. But let's not worry about that right now because conditions are looking great. Mother Nature is giving her thumbs up and I'm happy to report that the 45th Weather Squadron is go for weather. Daryl? Great update about the weather outside. Thank you, Will. We are currently L minus 17 minutes and counting until liftoff. Asteroids are prehistoric treasures that hold the lost stories about our origin of the solar system. Here's what else you need to know about Trojan asteroids. This mission is such an incredible opportunity and one of the many missions aimed at asteroid research right now. Let's head back out to NASA's Megan Cruz, who is with the head of NASA Science Missions. Megan. I am Daryl. Joining us right now is Dr. Thomas Zerbuk, and he's the Associate Administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Good to have you here this morning. I'm so glad to be here. What an exciting morning. It is, and I'm so glad you're here because i got to ask you a question. You know, first off, tell me a little bit about the Science Mission Directorate. What's the goal there? Well, so we're the organization at NASA that does all science, mm -hmm. you know, and it, of course, is planetary science, just like we're launching today. It's also astrophysics. I just got a picture of the James Webb Space Telescope that in the crate there in Kuru getting ready for launch and then it's the earth science, heliophysics, also uh, biological and physical sciences. That's all the science we do at the agency, just an amazing amount. Yeah, and when you became associate administrator of the um, science mission directorate, Lucy was the first mission you selected. Why is that? Well, so the timing was there. We had five mission candidates and I have to tell you, it was the first, it's one of these amazing decisions and, and of course many people helped with that. But I looked at this and this orbit and uh, science was so compelling. I said, we got to fly this. Yeah, the trajectory is amazing. I mean, the fact that we've been able to figure out how to get to the Trojan asteroids in, in relatively a short amount of time. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, it's so innovative, right? I mean, we actually, the science community had said, we want to do this, but we want to spend a half a billion or a billion dollars more than this team proposed. It's like, this is good money. Let's go do this. It's really innovative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how does Lucy tie into NASA's overall asteroid research that's going on right now? Well, we're really starting a decade of asteroid science, right? We're launching in 23. Uh, OSIRIS-REx is bringing back the samples of Bennu down kind of in, in Utah, will we'll come down there. Next year, 
We're going to be here again and launch Psyche. And just later this year, we're going to launch DART, which is the first collision experiment uh, trying to really deflect a potentially threatening uh, asteroid. You know, so, so for us, it's many parts and, ex you know, and of course, at the heart of it, Lucy, is just absolutely the mission of discovery. Yeah, we're really doing a lot of amazing things, and I think that you have a lot to do with that. So thank you so much, Dr. Zerbukit. I really appreciate you being here today. Appreciate it, Megan. Thanks so much. Awesome. Daryl, back to you. All right. Thank you, Megan. And we're just seconds away from the NASA launch manager poll. So let's get out to Joshua and Mick to pick it up. Guys? Hey, thanks, Daryl. Yes, uh, things, again, proceeding really well. Uh, appreciate the report from Will Ulrich because the weather is always the other side of the coin, right? We've got the launch team and the technical. we got the weather in good shape. Uh, as you see there, the rocket venting and uh, having the condensation appear around the rocket as we would typically expect. So everything healthy and, and on track. Uh, like Daryl just mentioned, we will hear from Omar Baez, the NASA launch manager. He'll be polling the NASA team so that he can in turn report out on the ULA launch conductor poll that will happen a few minutes later. Uh, so that should happen right here at L minus 13 minutes. Let's listen in for that now. This is the NLM on the NLM net, uh, just providing an update. The uh, range did uh, notify us that uh, one side of uh, the JDMTA uh, command site. Hey, so let's go ahead and uh, we're going to step away from that for now. Um, and we're going to, obviously there's something developing there. Uh, we were expecting to get that poll. And so we want to be respectful of what's happening there. The technical data, we're not sure that that's going to be approved for release. Uh, so obviously we'll be standing by to, to pay attention to that and give you updates as we understand more. Uh, but do want to kind of get back on track with talking about the, uh, oh, we are hearing that we think Omar is going to pick up with this poll. Coming up now. NASA CE, go. SMA? SMA, go. SMD? SMD, go. NASA Mission Manager? NASA Mission Manager, go. LSP? LSP is go. Copy that. The NASA team's ready to release the hold at T minus four minutes. Yes, yeah, so Joshua, what we heard there from uh, NASA Launch Manager Omar Baez is he was basically just briefing his NASA team and spacecraft customer of an issue that the team, uh, that the range had notified them of with one of their downrange assets. It sounds, looks like it was uh, partially mission capable today. The team accepted that and uh, they are ready to move forward, as you heard in the poll, that all systems are go for the NASA side. And uh, we'll be picking that up uh, as uh, launch conductor Scott Barney does his poll here in a little bit. Yeah, always a lot of things in play. Uh, we uh, will continue to track that. Again, a great sign that the team was able to work through that and approve uh, to move forward. Um, so we'll be back in a few minutes bringing you the final steps of the countdown uh, and a report up as we transition Lucy into internal power. Uh, but for now, Daryl, back to you. All right, thank you, Joshua and Mick. Lucy is going to visit as many asteroids in the faraway belt of Jupiter as we've ever discovered for near-Earth asteroids. And to get there, Lucy will need the right rocket and the right trajectory to carry out this historic mission. We headed out to ULA's vertical integration facility, where inside we were awestruck after walking onto a platform 18 stories above the ground, because just a few feet away was the Lucy spacecraft, inside its protective fairing and on top of an Atlas V rocket. ULA was making final preparations to roll this entire launch vehicle out of the vertical hangar we were in and onto the launch pad. Jermaine Oliver, good to see you, my good man. To see you too. Hey, thanks for coming out here and telling us about this flight trajectory and all the fun facts about Lucy going up to space. It's my pleasure. So, Jermaine, you are a flight design analyst with Launch Services Program. You know this flight pretty well. Tell me first about why we're launching at this specific time of year. We're trying to rendezvous with two different sets of asteroids that are on the Jupiter line, you know, Jupiter orbit. So in order to do that, you have to launch at a particular time to line up where the asteroids are going to be at, because if you don't, you'll either get there too early or get there too late. Can you so, believe how close we're standing here next to the spacecraft? I've never been this close before. This is great. Let me ask you about this fairing. What's its purpose? The fairing purpose is to encapsulate the satellite throughout, you know, throughout the time it's going through the atmosphere until it gets into space. So let's talk a little bit about the orbit. So this spacecraft is going out 530 million miles away from the sun. That's far, and it takes a careful orbit to get there. Yes, what happens is you have to use Earth gravity assist to slingshot yourself 
to each of the different asteroid trojans. So Lucy weighs about the same weight as a mid-sized vehicle, 3,400 pounds or so. Yeah. So it's pretty heavy. What kind of thrust does this rocket need to get it up off the ground and into space. Max thrust on this particular rocket is about 930,000 pounds of thrust and to get Lucy on a trajectory that's going about maybe 27,000, 28,000 miles per hour. Tell me about this rocket configuration, the Atlas 401. This is a four meter fairing that works great for this mission because given the spacecraft's weight about 1,500 kilograms and where it's going, the energy that it's going to, this particular rocket fits perfectly with it. I'm really excited about the journey as it begins right here, right now, with this entire rocket and spacecraft rolling out to the pad. That's pretty cool. Yes, it is. I've never seen it before, actually. I'll be, I'm excited to see how this goes today. You want to jump on and ride with the MLB? Oh, no, thank you. I'm fine. Thank you pass on that? I'm okay. Okay. Oh, look there. It's moving. Check it out. Well, Lucy's journey has begun. Isn't it amazing? Yes, it is. Lucy's on our way. Jarmaine Oliveira with Launch Services Program. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. And as that rolled out, we had to take some pictures and uh, yeah. even a selfie because you know what? I feel like we're the last people to be that close to that spacecraft, spacecraft going so far away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and few people get to be at the base of the pad. Even fewer get to be inside the VIF, especially at that moment of rollout. So that was a really cool opportunity awesome. that you had. Yep. All right. We are uh, inside of L minus eight minutes and coming up on the launch conductor pole shortly. So we want to hand it over to Joshua and Mick to take us the rest of the way through the countdown. Joshua? Hey, thanks, Marie. Uh, I would love to say that rocketry is a team sport, uh, and that's what we're going to get to kind of hear with this launch conductor pull in just a minute. Four major teams at play this morning, NASA Launch Services Program responsible for the launch, United Launch Alliance providing the vehicle, the ride to space. We have the uh, Southwest Research Institute, the NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and Lockheed Martin, part of the spacecraft team, and then the Space Force. Yeah, Joshua, we're very happy to have Space Force here as they uh, protect the range and look at the weather. They're also responsible for vehicle and personnel safety today. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion, go. Hydraulics, go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. Water, go. Centaur systems, propulsion, so behind. go. Pneumatics, go. LO2, go. LH2, go. Hasgas, go. Electrical systems, airborne, go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight Control. Go. GCQ. Go. Operations Support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Red Line Monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Ops Safety Manager. Go. ULA Safety Officer. Go. Vehicle System Engineer. Go. Anomaly Chief. Go. Range Coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch Director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC, verify T0 is set for 0934 Zulu. Verified. So Joshua, a uh, very successful poll there by launch conductor Scott Barney. As you also heard, we verified that T0 is set for uh, 0934 Zulu time. That's 534 local. Uh, very happy to hear everybody green and go. And in, in particular, our friends at the range there, uh, our Space Force friends, uh, gave a clear for the range today. That's awesome. They're doing their job not only with weather but the safety. Uh, we also heard a little earlier in the count this morning that the range reported there are no colas this morning, which are collision avoidance uh, uh, assessments so we are good for our first initial part of the launch window this morning 534 all steps are complete prior to terminal count yeah big thanks to the space launch delta 45 folks for all their support uh, so looking ahead to terminal count we just heard the call that the spacecraft is configured for flight that includes being transitioned to internal power uh, and then like i mentioned before the next few steps are all about getting the launch vehicle and the spacecraft uh, able to live on their own. So those are the things coming up here. Uh, we do have this release of the built-in hold. Uh, the eagle-eyed viewers that can see behind us might have noticed that there's a clock sitting at T minus four minutes and holding. Uh, it's been that way for our entire show so far. That will then sync up with our L clock you see on screen at this moment, and those will count towards zero together. Again, everything looking great for liftoff on time here at, at uh, 5.34.
Yeah, Joshua, as we come out of this hole, the, you know, what's very impressive this morning is this Atlas 401. We heard Jarmaine talk about it. It's a 401 configuration, a four-meter fairing, zero solids on it, and one single uh, Centaur engine on the second stage. Uh, this is a great uh, configuration for the Lucy mission. It is the most common flown uh, configuration by United Launch Alliance, and uh, this will be the, the 89th uh, Atlas V uh, launching, so we're very proud of that. Two, one, mark. And there we go, the clocks are released, so we are ticking down here uh, towards liftoff. Five. Ground pyro is enabled. Yeah, we'll hear the team securing a lot of their things, getting their final configurations in place, and making sure the rocket is ready for a T-0 liftoff this morning, so the team will be working very quickly. Yeah, and uh, opposed to the missions that we might be used to with where we're hitting a low Earth orbit trajectory, uh, this one is going into deep space, and so we'll be exceeding uh, escape velocity of Earth this morning. Uh, so that's up and over 25,000 miles per hour. We know that over the course of Lucy's mission, she will get up to about 400,000 miles per hour. So very, very fast with all those Earth uh, gravity assists. And for those that are in the physical area, uh, you'll also notice that this rocket will take a little bit more of a southern track than we're typically used to seeing. We usually see rockets take off more towards the northeast this one will move a little bit more towards the southeast than is typical. Yeah, and with that southerly trajectory, uh, people ought to be able to see some great things with the weather the way it is today. Three a minute. So Alice tanks to flight pressure. Securing LO2 topping. 250. FTS internal. So there we heard the teams uh, securing the uh, topping and bringing the Atlas tanks to flight pressure. That's a huge milestone as we get ready for T-0 this morning. The teams have finished putting LOX and hydrogen on board and making sure that uh, all that 740,000 pounds of fuel is there for liftoff of Lucy. We also heard that the team uh, brought in the flight termination system arm. That is part of the range safety that is needed for the vehicles we lift off this morning. Yeah, previewing what's, what's to come ahead, so stay with us after liftoff. We'll be tracking with a couple burns of the Centaur, uh, spacecraft separation, those beautiful solar arrays deploying, and then signal uh, acquisition of signal will kind of be the end of our, our show for you today, beginning a 12-year, 4 billion mile journey for Lucy. Absolutely. 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Launch sequences start. 150. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LO2. 140. Launch enabled. 137. FTS armed. 90 seconds to go. One twenty. OCU's armed. SCS count started. One ten. Vent valves locked. One minute. Rock, report range status. Range green. All right, so stay with us again after liftoff. Uh, we'll also have the voice chiming in from uh, Rob Kesselman from ULA. Uh, he'll be providing the launch vehicle ascent data. Forty. Stable at step three. So that's a great uh, sign right there, stable at step three. Everything is at flight pressures. We're now the only thing left, Joshua, is that final status check uh, with the whole team. 25 seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Lucy. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Atlas V takes flight sending Lucy to uncover the fossils of our solar system. Tower clear. Rocket 180 propellant utilization has gone to close loop control. The vehicle has begun the pitch yaw roll maneuver. Now 
30 seconds into flight. Vehicle is 0.6 miles in altitude, traveling at 939 miles per hour. Body 180 performance continues to look good at this time. Engine pump speeds and injector pressures are in family for this thrust level. Atlas vehicle attitude remains stable at this time. Attitude rates are near zero in all, in all axes. Now at T plus 70 seconds into flight, vehicle is 4 miles in altitude, 0.2 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,200 miles per hour. Mark 1, Atlas is now supersonic. Vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. The vehicle is now throttling down slightly. Body 180 engine parameters continue to look nominal after the prior adjustment to the thrust level. Approximately two minutes remain in the Atlas booster phase of flight. The Atlas V rocket weighs now just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of 2,600 pounds per second. Vehicle is now executing closed loop steering. Center 5 central reaction control system is now pressurizing the flight levels. So beautiful launch sequence there. Uh, we do have uh, another minute and a half or so to go with the booster in operation, uh, getting uh, loose. We're now just under three minutes into flight. Atlas is 33 miles in altitude, 59 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,600 miles per hour. So Lucy being lifted up out of the atmosphere by the booster, getting on its way into a park orbit uh, before we get towards... Uh, All first stage vehicle systems are operating as expected at this time. Future, uh, future portions of the launch activity, we have the, the Centaur multiple burns ahead and spacecraft separation. And the big milestone we should see Josh coming up is booster engine cutoff, which would be the first stage cutoff and then stage The main separation. engine is now throttling to maintain a constant 5G acceleration limit. We're going to see a few things happen pretty rapidly. The, the booster will cut off just after four minutes. And then within the next 15 seconds after that, we should see the Atlas separate from the Centaur and then the Centaur engine ignite for its first burn. Centaur has begun the boost phase chill down sequence. And the RD-180 is now throttling to maintain a constant 4.6 G acceleration limit. Boost phase chill down sequence has completed. And we have Pico booster engine cutoff and a successful stage separation event. So what you're seeing on screen is an animation that's being driven by actual telemetry. Please on the RL-10. So we are watching these things uh, in an animation happen here, but they're happening in real time as well. And we that's one. We have ignition for the first burn. All right, so there we go. Uh, we should see the, fair, the fairing jettison here. We have indication of good payload fairing jettison. And there we go. All right, Nick, so that wraps up the, the first round of, of major milestones here. Uh, still very much in the middle of dynamic flight. The uh, system on the RL-10 is now in an open loop burn-off mode to burn off excess fuel in the early portion of this burn. So walk us quickly through, Mick. What are we looking for uh, in the next, in this burn and the next one? So this burn is going to end with uh, Miko uh, getting uh, Centaur and Lucy into its park orbit around Earth. And then we will then get into MESS-2, which will get us into that transfer orbit, getting Lucy on its way. Awesome. So that's going to do it for now, uh, finishing up the initial launch activities. Everything sounding like it's going perfectly. Uh, Daryl, back to you.
Thank you, Joshua and Mick. A beautiful launch out here from our vantage point. Incredible. All right. Lucy was built at the Lockheed Martin facility in Colorado before arriving at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for launch. Engineers at Lockheed's Waterton facility use lessons learned from prior spacecraft like New Horizons and OSIRIS-REx to build Lucy. And in July, Lucy was packed up and flown on board a United States Air Force C-17 cargo plane from Colorado to the launch and landing facility runway at the Kennedy Space Center. From there, Lucy was transported to an Astrotech Space Operations Processing Facility in nearby Titusville for final preparations before liftoff. Yeah, just a few miles from here before it was brought to the pad. For more about how Lucy was built, let's send it over to NASA's Megan Cruz. Hey, Daryl. Yeah, right now I'm joined by Ari Vogel. He's the Deep Space Exploration Director at Lockheed Martin Space. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. Wasn't that just a beautiful launch? What did you think about that? Incredible. You know, seeing it go over the clouds and bright up, brighten up the whole sky was just fantastic. Yeah, to see it rise over the clouds, because, you know, we lost it a little bit because of some cloud coverage, but then it just rose out of it. It was so beautiful. And, yeah. you know, I really wanted to talk to you because you, your team at Lockheed Martin Space knew that you were going into a project that would require require you to develop a spacecraft that would travel farther than any other solar powered spacecraft yeah. ever. I mean, was that intimidating? You know, it was a, it was a really exciting challenge to, to solve, right? And obviously, the most prominent feature of Lucy is their big solar arrays. Each one is about the length of a bus. And, um, you know, what we did is we basically just broke the problem down into smaller pieces and then applied systems thinking to make sure that the design trades we were doing uh, didn't impact or that we fully understood the impacts for over the 12-year mission. So, you know, being the farthest uh, solar-powered spacecraft is certainly something that was difficult to prepare for, um, as is going to a record eight asteroids in one mission. Uh, but that's why we have such a comprehensive test like you fly program at Lockheed Martin and we took it through the ringer at our facility in Denver. Yeah, and you did it all within 14 months. That's during a pandemic. That's incredible. Can you talk to me about the challenges of that? Yeah, you know, it's it's really awe-inspiring. I mean, to, to be able to, to build a one-of-a-kind one spacecraft during normal circumstances is incredible. And the team just really pulled together, didn't miss a beat, connected and collaborated, you know, made sure that we didn't, uh, didn't have any mistakes. And it really accelerated some of our digital transformation initiatives too, having to, to work during the pandemic. And not a single shift was missed during integration and test due wow. to COVID. So team just did an awesome job, leadership with the preparation and the over communication and the transparency. And then all the team, you know, just didn't let their commitment to, to Lucy waver. And I think the thing that I'm most proud about actually is, is that through it all, we still continue to all of our STEM events, all our mentoring, our coaching, uh, Lockheed Martin, NASA, Southwest Research in Institute, hundreds of thousands of hours in, into that. So it was really, really a great job. And really quick, you also built the antenna that's on there that's going to help us communicate with Lucy. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we did. A uh, six and a half foot uh, wide antenna that, that we built. Main job is to is to do the communication between the spacecraft. And, um, you know, it's also going to send back some of the first images of the Trojans. So I the whole team is super excited yeah, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much, Ari. I really appreciate you being here today so and much. for bringing Lucy to life. So thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, Daryl, back to you. All right, thank you, Megan. And in case you're just joining us, we here at uh, NASA are at the beginning of Lucy's 530-mile journey to the Trojan asteroids beyond the sun, going to the same orbit, Marie, as Jupiter. That's right. It was a beautiful launch here. We could see it light up the water behind us, and we actually had a gator in the water just behind us. Oh, <laughs> joining us too. for liftoffs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, jo Lucy is named after a skeleton fossil more than 3 million years old. Lucy was an early early human ancestor, and the Trojan asteroids are fossils, too, of how planets were formed. Beyond the asteroid belt are fossils of planet formation, known as the Trojan asteroids. These primitive bodies share Jupiter's orbit in two vast swarms, leading and trailing the planet. Now. NASA is preparing to visit seven asteroids. Embarking on a 12-year odyssey that will span Jupiter's orbit. One mission 
will explore these objects for the first time. Lucy, the first mission to the Trojan Asteroids. And uh, another special guest that we had watching the launch from the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center was none, on our, none other than uh, NASA's Associate Administrator, Bob Cabana. He is standing by with uh, Blair Allen of NASA EDGE. Um, actually, uh, they're telling me that we lost audio uh, with that group, so we will... We will come back to that um, if we can, but uh, while they try to work out their audio issues, but Daryl, uh, you know, we had we had a really unmatched view of of launch here. It was just spectacular. Yeah, it was incredible because uh, we're sitting. You can't really tell, but this behind us is the Kennedy Basin, right. the Turn Basin, where they brought in, uh, you know, the space shuttle uh, main uh, tank, mm -hmm. as well as just recently uh, the core stage for the Artemis rocket, which is in uh, the VAB right now getting stacked. You're looking at the flight of Centaur and Lucy. We are L plus 11 minutes and 26 seconds as we cruise along and we want to talk a little bit now about the message that Lucy is going to be sending. That's right. Uh, Lucy is carrying something on board. Um, aside from her scientific instruments, she's got something a little more philosophical. There is actually a plaque affixed to the side of the Lucy spacecraft and it contains quotes and messages from artists, poets, and thought leaders. And the plaque is meant to serve as a time capsule of sorts for our own descendants. You see, after Lucy's 12-year mission is complete, the spacecraft will remain on a stable orbit, traveling back and forth between the Earth and the Trojan asteroids for perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. And one day, in the distant future, our descendants may be able to retrieve Lucy. Uh, there it is, this, the uh, the plaque you can see on the mm. side of the spacecraft. Wow. This was uh, before uh, Lucy was packed inside the payload fairing. Uh, but this is meant to be uh, a relic for our and for our descendants uh, of the early days of humanity's exploration of the solar system. Uh, and when they do, they will see some great messages. We'll see those. Uh, we'll talk more about those in just a couple of minutes. We um, oh, we actually yeah. have. We do have it. Yeah. Um, so this is um, a representation. It's hidden a little bit behind your computer, Daryl. Oh, yeah, um, let me get that down. <laughs> Yeah. But this is the actual plaque on the spacecraft is about a tenth of the size of this. So this is blown up. Yeah. Um, but it's got um, a diagram on it. This shows the positions of the planets as they are today on the day of the Lucy launch. That's right. And there are some great quotes. You mentioned some of the great philosophers and uh, thought leaders over time. Down at the bottom left, you can see... Uh, that one there is from Albert Einstein. The important thing is to never stop questioning. And then in the middle, we've got uh, the Beatles. In fact, every single Beatle four, is yep. here, including John Lennon. And he says, we'll all shine on like the moon and the stars and the sun. And then up here at the top, um, actually, right here on the far right, we've got mm -hmm. Amanda Gorman, who just came to recent fame at the presidential inauguration. And she actually wrote this poem specifically for Lucy. And there's a great quote in here. She says, hope implores us, may ancient, um, the ancient study and the uncompromising core of us to keep rising for an earth more than worth fighting for. Her, Great she, words yeah, from a is, young poet. Yes, yeah, she's a she's an amazing poet. Just blows me away. Uh, we are going to uh, now get a look at uh, some more of the messages uh, that we intend to leave behind for our descendants. Take a look. And this is what I want to say to people, to beings, to consciousness who are so far away, I can't even imagine them. To represent our culture accurately, we should include hopelessness, risk-taking, the role of fortune, good or bad. To understand each desire has an itch, 
to know that we are responsible for the lives we change. No faith comes without cost. No one believes without dying. There are no curses, only mirrors held up to the souls of gods and mortals. Remember, you are all people, and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe. This universe is you. I would just like to say that this wonderful emissary to the Trojan asteroids is itself a message. Lucy speaks for all that is best about human ingenuity, curiosity, and endeavor. Do you still have birds that wake you up in the morning with their singing and lovers who gaze at the stars, trying to read in them the fate of their love? If you do, you'll recognize one another. And receive those, those words inscribed on a plaque from all of us, for all of us, filled with those those aspirations and that inspiration and that imagination that we need so much right now. A little noisy, but I'm so excited. Lucy is going back in the sky with diamonds. Johnny will love that. Anyway, if you meet anyone up there, Lucy, give them peace and love from me. All right, we've got that audio issue taken care of, so we're going to go over now to NASA Edge's Blair Allen, standing by with Bob Cabana. Blair? Thanks so much, Marie. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties. You know, the, uh, the launch was so impressive, even our gear was affected. Uh, but, Bob, it's really impressive to see this launch this morning. Tell us, how is it from your perspective? Well, uh, first off, from my perspective, I, I got my very own NASA Edge microphone. I'm just elated. <laughs> now, Blair, you know, anytime you see a rocket ship leave planet Earth, it is an experience. It's a feast for the senses, sight, sound, and feel. It's emotional. And having Lucy on board, I mean, this is the coolest <laughs> darn mission, going to the Trojan asteroids. Looking back at the beginning of our universe five billion years ago, absolutely amazing. And that's kind of what's impressive. I mean, we're talking about this important science mission. But here at Kennedy, we've had 24 launches so far. What's going on? Well, I, I tell you, first off, I could not be more proud of our NASA team, our contractor civil service team that has persevered through this pandemic, not missing a beat, you know, making all our missions. I mean, we've launched humans to the International Space Station for the first time since the end of the shuttle program during it. We've launched Perseverance to Mars. You know, we're getting ready to launch James Webb here in uh, December. That's going to be amazing. And, and getting Lucy off on time. You know, we only, if we didn't get off in this this launch window. We're talking another year before we launch. Yeah, and uh, that is impressive to see how things came together so perfectly. But tell us a little bit about what's coming down the pike. You've, we've seen a lot of things happen <laughs> here at Kennedy and lots of things to look forward to. Well, absolutely. You know, I mean, first off, from a science mission point of view. Uh, of course, next month we're going out to the West Coast for DART, then yep. we're coming back here in December for Ixby. Yep. In December, down in French Guiana, we're launching James Webb. What an amazing yeah. telescope that's going to be. A 21-foot mirror, you know, and then a solar shield, a sun shield the size of a tennis court. You know, they talk about the nine minutes of terror <laughs> landing on Mars. Right. We're talking four weeks of nail, <laughs> nail biting as that thing unfolds. But to look back, 13 and a half billion years, almost to the beginning of our, our universe, you know, three and a half, 350 million years from the beginning, it's going to be amazing. And then over in the vehicle assembly building over yeah. there in High Bay 3, stacked up, is that awesome space launch system, that Boeing core stage with the Northrop Grumman solids and those four Aerojet <laughs> Rocketdyne RS-25s. Yeah. The Orion spacecraft rolls over here in, uh, on the 19th, stacked down on top. It's going out to the pad for a wet dress rehearsal, and then we're going to launch it to the moon. We're going to do that first test flight without crew in preparation for going back to the moon in a sustainable way so that we can go on to Mars. Just so much going on. I, I love it. Thank you so much for being on the show. From center director now to NASA <laughs> administrator, back to you, Marie. Great things here at NASA. All right. Thank you, Blair. One of the asteroids Lucy will visit, Euripides, has already given researchers a recent surprise revealed by the Hubble Space Telescope. Take a look. 
On January 9th, 2020, NASA's Lucy mission team revealed that the spacecraft would be visiting not seven asteroids as planned, but eight. As it turns out, Euripides, one of the Trojan asteroids along Lucy's path, has a small satellite or moonlet orbiting it. Finding these tiny new worlds before Lucy is launched in 2021 means that the team can investigate their orbits and plan for more detailed follow-up observations during flybys. Dr. Keith Knoll and other Lucy Science team members have been using the Hubble Space Telescope to search for satellites and rings around Lucy's targets. This can be challenging since the raw images are often filled with bumps, blobs, and diffraction spikes. The Lucy team didn't see any evidence of a new satellite until November 2019. After experimenting with the brightness and contrast on the Hubble images, Dr. Knoll saw a peculiar faint spot near the much brighter Euripides. Dr. Mike Brown, another team member, noticed the spot showed up in a slightly different position on another set of Hubble images taken two days later. This change suggested that the spot was an orbiting satellite. The team went back to Hubble and got three more chances to make observations of the possible new satellite. On the first two tries, the little moonlet was nowhere to be found. But on the third observation, on January 3rd, 2020, they found the possible new satellite again. It was clearly visible next to Euripides, which was over 6,000 times brighter. This huge difference in brightness suggests that the satellite is less than one kilometer in diameter, very small compared to Euripides at 64 kilometers. With a few more Hubble observations, the team pinned down the new satellite's orbit, and they proposed a name. The International Astronomical Unit approved, and from now on, the little satellite will be known as Keta, after Enriqueta Basilio, the first woman to light the Olympic cauldron. Evidence indicates that the Trojan asteroid Euripides is the largest fragment from a massive asteroid collision that happened billions of years ago. It is possible that the new satellite Keta is a remnant of that catastrophic event, whether with Hubble or with the Lucy spacecraft's flyby. Each observation enriches our understanding about the Trojan asteroid's formation and Euripides' relationship with its newly discovered companion. The discovery of this new moonlet around the Trojan asteroid Euripides is just a preview of the incredible scientific knowledge that will be captured by the Lucy mission as it explores this area of our solar system. All right, our, our next guest is uh, one of the great minds behind the mighty Atlas V, uh, which just had another spectacular launch here. He's standing by with uh, Franklin Fitzgerald from NASA Edge over at the ASOC. Franklin? Yeah, thanks, Marie. I'm here with Scott Messer, ULA program manager. Uh, Scott, how did the launch go from ULA, ULA's perspective? Well, uh, it was uh, near perfect so far. Uh, we, we never uh, claim success until we separate and get the spacecraft where it wants to be, but uh, so far the first stage was great. The countdown was very quiet, and uh, it's a beautiful launch so far.